Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Rachel Wojtek, and we talked about Daniel in Babylon last week, and this week we're talking about Daniel in a different empire. <laughs> He's one of these strange individuals who gets to be a high up in two consecutive different kingdoms. I... I'm sure we'll talk about how he managed that. It seems like quite a trick. Well, yeah, that, 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 I don't know how much of a trick it was, but there are reasons that I think we'll, be, we'll stumble across maybe along the way. Anyway, we left off last time with Nebuchadnezzar having been dead for some time. Daniel is an old man, but he is still in the king's service. The throne has passed through a succession of weak hands, and Nebuchadnezzar's um, son-in-law, Nebuchadnezzar, is in charge of the empire. But he's had a spat with the priests at Babylon because he favors the moon god and they favor Marduk. So he's moved the administrative capital down into the desert to a place called Timon which is on a brand new uh, trade route through the Arabian Desert, where he's raking in the bucks. And he's left his son, Belshazzar, or Belshazzar, if you prefer, in charge of the city of Babylon. And that's where Daniel's hanging out these days, living out the end of his life. Well, you'd think. Meanwhile, to the north and the east, there's a new kingdom on the horizon. And this this becomes one of the places where secular history and uh, sacred history begin to intertwine, or at least look each other in the eye and, and scoff a bit. Because now we run into the Greek writer Herodotus, <laughs> the father of history, the guy who's free from nonsense and tells it like it is, the guy who looks for naturalistic causes and will have no nonsense, no mythology, no legend in his books. Huh. Maybe compared to the other Greeks. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's a line in Herodotus that says that from the beginning, the Greeks have been more free from foolishness than other peoples. <laughs> then you read Herodotus. <laughs> yeah. okay. I'll tell you, I, I hadn't cracked open my volume of Herodotus before prepping for this. <laughs> um, and the first line, I have to commend the translator. Hold on, let me grab it. Because I looked at another translation of the opening line uh -huh. of Herodotus's history. And uh, it was nowhere near as arresting as this version. <laughs> According to the Persians, best informed in history, the Phoenicians began the quarrel. <laughs> like, tell me that's not a great line. Yeah, that's a great line. <laughs> that's a great line. Yeah. Uh, I was uh, skimming internet articles and I kept running across uh, the idea that Herodotus is setting forth this conflict between Eastern despotism, Persia, and Western freedom, the Greeks. <laughs> That's got to be one of the stupidest ideas anybody <laughs> has ever suggested for an analysis of history. But apparently the Greeks thought that. I don't know why, given their love for tyranny and uh, the rise of Alexander and all of that. But nonetheless, and yes, the quarrel between East and West goes back to, you got it, stealing women, Herodotus <laughs> says, all the way back to, even before Helen of Troy, there were some other snatches back and forth and... There's a line in Herodotus that amounts to, you know, and, and this kind of thing happens. And the best thing to do is just take no notice of it because women right. aren't going to be snatched unless they really want to be. So let's, we should have just got over that. But we didn't. And then so. You know, boyish pranks, stealing yeah, a mascot exactly. from the rival college. <laughs> right. Exactly. It's, what's, what's the big deal here? But it, it led to wars. <sighs> so Persia does not appear in the table of nations because Persia didn't exist for a very, very long time. In fact, when Isaiah and Jeremiah both prophesy the downfall of Babylon, they don't specify Persian conquerors because there wasn't a Persia. They use the word media. The Medes are related to the Persians, but there was no Persian empire until Cyrus comes along because he creates it. And, and, and there's some of the story. Um, Herodotus, in order to tell us at least his version popular legends, mythology, or who knows, maybe it really happened this way because weirder things happen in politics. Mm -hmm. um, the king of media, Astyages, 
had a daughter who he had married off to a Persian lord, Cambyses. This daughter, Man Mandane, um, was to, to, to push her aside, no big deal, until she's pregnant. And then Asagis begins having dreams that from her private parts are coming out great vines that are reaching into Asia and Europe and, and taking over the world. And he's very nervous about this, because this is a weird dream to have about your daughter. He calls the Magi, the, the scholarly class, the priestly class, and says, what's going on here? And they say, well, it's obvious. Your daughter's going to give birth to a child who's going to usurp you and take over all of these territories. Might want to do something about that, boss. And Astaga says, hmm, well, that's just not good. So as soon as the child is born, he has one of his generals, Harpagus, go and take the newborn babe with instructions to destroy it. Now, we all know how this goes. You <laughs> never same way give... every time. Yeah, you don't give the baby to your right-hand man telling him to destroy the kid. Because you know what's going to happen. He, the right-hand man is too smart for that. Yeah. <laughs> he, he, he knows what's want, good for him. <laughs> yeah, he does not want to be the one who's going to be blamed in the future. So he go finds, goes and finds a shepherd who works for the king as boss and says, here... Take this baby, you destroy it, <laughs> and bring me proof again, and I'll be back. Well, the shepherd gets home and, and finds out, you know, <sighs> baby, I don't want to kill it. And the, and the mom says, the wife says, good, because we just lost our baby. Let's do a switch. This is right out of Oedipus Rex. <laughs> let's, do a, let's do a switch. And uh, you can take the dead baby, dress our baby up in royal finery. You can hand him back to Harpagus. He'll have his evidence. Everybody be happy. We'll raise the little boy as our own son. No one will ever know. Ten years later, <laughs> when Cyrus has grown up a little, not enough to be a, you know, strapping junior higher or whatever that would amount to. Uh, he's out in the, the palace courts playing with other boys who are of higher rank than he is, but he does work for the shepherd of the king, so he manages to get into this somehow. And he is the leader of the boys. He, they, they decide they're going to play king, and he gets to be the king and boss people around and tell them what to do. And there is a uh, son of a lordling who refuses because you're a shepherd boy. I'm not going to, you're not going to tell me what to do. I'm the king in this game. You will do what I tell you to do. No, I'm not doing a thing. Guys, grab him. And then Thy Cyrus thrashes him very thoroughly. <laughs> Has him whipped. <laughs> Has him whipped. The boy goes home, complains to his dad. The dad goes to the king and says, what's this with a shepherd boy beating up on my son? Uh, the king summons the the shepherd of the boy, looks at him and says, um, wow, looks you look awfully fam familiar. You look awfully familiar. <laughs> tell me, shepherd, where did the, what, what, tell me what happened. Goes, so your, your son here was acting like a king in the face of all these noble children. Uh-huh. Well, you know, it's just his way because he's cool and all. But, you know, he didn't mean anything by it. Sorry for any offense. Yeah, all right. Um, how'd you, where, where, where'd the boy come from? Oh, he's our natural son. Yeah, right. Um, Take him away and torture. No, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. Let me, I'll, I'll tell you the whole story. <laughs> I look. So my wife and I, and apparently the wife's name was the equivalent of a female dog. Mm -hmm. Thus, the legend that Cyrus was raised, like everybody else in this situation. <laughs> by wolves. By wolves. <laughs> yes. <laughs> kind of. Impossible to have a, a uh, Peggy yeah. King who's not raised by wolves. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just, it doesn't, you know. Um, anyway, uh, Saggy says, all right, fine. As far as he's concerned, all right, the boy is obviously his grandson. He's alive, killing him now is kind of, well, always wanted a grandson. Here he is. Nothing bad's happened. However, Harpagus disobeyed me, betrayed me. So that, well, somebody's got to do something about that. Uh, yeah. So yeah, he, call, he, he calls Harpagus and says, um, mm-hmm. Oh, well, yes, my uh, your majesty. You see, I knew that one day this would happen and one day you'd want your grandson. So I was just playing smart for all of us. Aren't you glad he's alive? Yeah. In fact, I'm so glad. Come to a party later. Come to a banquet. Oh, and send your son ahead. He can play with Cyrus while we're waiting. 
Uh, not not reading between the lines very well. Harpica sends his son along, who Astegis takes, kills, butchers, chops up, and has his chef cook. And when Harpicus comes, he gets served his son unknowingly until at the very end when he's asked, you want to know what this wonderful dish you should be eating? Sure. Open the little serving bowl. And there's the skull and the hands and the feet. Like, you know what that is? Oh, I know your majesty. Uh-huh. Don't ever betray me again. No, your majesty. I will never betray you. <sighs> Cyrus grows up. And um, Harpicus has a little bit of, he, he, he wants to stir up the pot here. He begins sending messengers to, to Cyrus and say, look, your, your grandpa would have killed you. I saved you. Forget him. You should be king. And, um, you know, I'll help you. And here's some ideas. And basically, he sells out the empire to Cyrus. Cyrus, according to Herodotus, now a grown man and, and wily in his own right, uh, grabs the Persian soldiers, who are subordinate to the Medians at this point, and says, um, you know, come with me, I got, I got something for you to do. And he has them spend a whole day clear, clearing land. It's no fun. Picking up rocks, digging ditches, you know, stuff like that. Like, this was stupid. Why do we do it? Okay, tomorrow, come tomorrow. And he gives them a great party. Using all the money he has, he gives them this wonderful banquet, this wonderful party. Yeah, this is more like it. We like it. Which would you rather do for the rest of your life? Yesterday, where you're slaves and have to work all the time, or today, where you're on top of everything and um, you get to party all the time? Oh, we like the partying. Well, you know what? If you take the kingdom away from the medians, you'll get to party all the time. Let's get them, boss. So the thing, so that's according to Herodotus, more or less, is what's been going on. And so Cyrus is busy taking what had been Chaldean or Babylonian territory to the east and to the north and on into Asia Minor, to the Greek colonies. Uh, along the way, he runs into a king. We all know this story. The king asks the Oracle Delphi, should I challenge Cyrus? <laughs> and if the, you do, you will destroy <laughs> a great empire. <laughs> exactly. So he says, cool, and takes on Cyrus and loses and uh, throws a fit, and finally, when when Cyrus captures him and does not immediately kill him, says, "May I have permission to do one thing? What's that? I want to send word back to the Oracle <laughs> at Delphi and say, what was that all about? You lied to me. Well, you, you're conned me. That's just stupid.' And so he said, "Go for it. That's fine." And the Oracle replies, "Look, the reply was deliberately vague. Why weren't you smart <laughs> enough to ask which empire? That's not on us, guy. <laughs> you screwed up." He said, "Oh." Yeah, I guess you're right. Um, and that brings us more or less to Daniel chapter 5. The armies of Cyrus the Persian are closing in on Babylon. They've closed in on Babylon. Now, Babylon's a huge city. The river Euphrates runs through it. There are fields and pastures. It's supposed to be able to stand a siege for 70 years. That is all, anybody's lifetime. Cyrus should not be able to get in this place. All they have to do, all the Babylonians, the Chaldeans have to do is hold it together. Make sure no one turns traitor and throws open the gates or anything like that. Short of that, just sit it out. And eventually, as far as they can see, Cyrus and the Persians and the Medes are going to have to go away. Uh, and so, to stir up morale, the third in command, Belshazzar, throws a party for his lords. And the goal here is to lift their spirits, call upon their gods, show how the Babylon's gods have defeated everyone else's gods forever and forever. Don't worry. Be happy. Let's party. It's okay. Somewhere the party in the to prove we have nothing to worry about. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, and, and either of you, feel, in, feel free to jump in and take over the storyline. Uh, Belshazzar... Um, decides he's going to do it one better. For a long time, he's had a resentment against the God of the Hebrew people. We're not told all the details, but we will find out eventually. He knows what happened to Nebuchadnezzar, how God humbled him. He knows that this guy, Daniel, has always been kind of on the fringes. And although he's been a little de demoted, he has worked for Belshazzar. In fact, he's worked in Elam, the Persian court. <laughs> hmm. wonder who he might have met while he was there. 
So uh, Belshazzar has this great idea. Let's let's go to the temple vessels. Now, back in chapter one of Daniel, we were introduced to the temple vessels. The young men and the temple vessels came together. The young men were put into service in Babylon. The temple vessels were put in the temple of uh, Belmarduk, their chief god. There's a correlation here. The, the bodies, the vessels of the young men, and the vessels that serve God in his temple. Has, has God forsaken his people? Has he forsaken his worship? Has he forsaken everything ordained? Is, is something going to happen here? Well, Belshazzar pushes the point. He takes those vessels out and brings them into his feast and uses them to toast his own gods and offer deliberate insult to Yahweh. And just to make sure there's plenty of light, he lights the menorah and lets it illuminate his drunken party. And as he sits there and watches, a finger, a hand appears in midair, scrabbling in the plaster of the wall. Words that, Neb that Belshazzar cannot recognize, cannot read, and they're being written by a hand, a disembodied hand. This is not good. His knees start knocking. He loses bladder control and other things. And uh, calls for the wise men. Have we been here before? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so interesting that the the light of the temple coming, bringing your deeds into the light of God, mm -hmm. inviting evaluation, <laughs> clear sight. Yeah, it's, well, it's you, just funny. And often you know? the the word of the light of God is often associated with the word of God, and so mm -hmm. now God speaks. Well, he doesn't even use his voice. He speaks through just written words. His finger writes in stone, as mm. he did once before. Mm. The words, as the King James renders them, many, many tackle you farce and use copulative. It's and. <laughs> um, the plural of or the, the singular I think it's a singular one version, singular or plural. One is Farce and one is Perses. Perses sounds an awful lot like Persian. So there's God's punning again. Yes, God puns. <laughs> um, but they can probably read the consonants. There are probably are no vowels, but they can read the consonants. Like, but what in the world does that mean? If they were smart enough, they might recognize that these are all um, weights of money. Uh, we, we hear tekel, but think shekel. And all the others are also Amina. It's also a coin. You see, but in, in those days, we, we hadn't gotten onto coining things. We weighed amounts of gold and silver in scale. Thus, you are weighed in the balance. Anyhow, the wise men can't do anything with this yet again. Uh, and Belshazzar is, is desperate. Um, can't somebody do this? Can't somebody read this? Uh, I'll, I'll make him third ruler of the kingdom, that is, after himself and Abinidus, and give him authority and all this stuff. No one can help. And then the queen mother shows up. It's the queen mother because his, all of his wives are already present. So she comes in, and she plays it real cool. She says, basically, uh, there's, a, there's a guy. Don't worry, I know a guy. In... In him is the spirit of the holy gods of Elohim. Wisdom and understanding was found in him in the days of your grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, whom he made ruler over all the magicians, mages, astrologers, and so on. And he's capable of dissolving doubts and interpreting dreams. Call this man. Uh, his name was Belteshazzar. You may know him as Daniel. And she does it all in the sense of... Sure, you never heard of him. Sure, you probably slipped your mind. I'm sure you'll jump at this chance, grandson. Um, uh, or son, I suppose. Um, and um, he does, because he's desperate. This is scary stuff. He calls for Daniel. Are you that Daniel, the children of the captivity of Jewry? You one of those slaves that we picked up a long time ago? I've heard about you. Yes, you have. Um, if you can do anything here, you know, we got some rewards going on here. There's a reward program. And Daniel says, let thy gifts be to thyself. Give thy rewards to another. But I'll read the writing. And he walks him down memory lane and says, look, 
This is what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. This is how God humbled him. This is God, how, how God saved him, changed his heart. Um, and you have not humbled yourself, though you knew all of this. This is not some ignorant, superstitious monarch who's getting caught in a war of rival religions that are beyond his understanding. He knows exactly yeah. who Yahweh this is. is. Willful apostasy. This is willful apostasy. His grandfather had come to faith in God and written scripture, and he wants nothing to do with it. He, doesn't, he wants to pretend he's never even heard of this. And Daniel says, no, that's not happening. I think so, at this point, I would interject one thing. Therefore, as I was reading various things online, of course, some of the people taking Daniel 5 um, were looking particularly at parallels to Revelation and mm -hmm. spinning certain uh, eschatological views oh, yes. <laughs> from them. And I think it's really important to make the point that Babylon here is, they're receiving more revelation from God because there were believers there. They were people yeah. who had, the king had turned to God. There were others presumably that heard and believed and they're being judged for their apostasy, not for their paganism. Mm, um, it's good. not, it's not just a false, a false kingdom it's a kingdom that was belonging to the Lord and no longer does. Um, so when we see the Babylon appear again in Revelation, we should be thinking this was somebody, this was a group that was God's people that yes. have turned from him. You know, and it's very good. And beyond that, this was the kingdom that had been charged to look after God's people. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was their covenant responsibility as Gentiles. They were caretakers for Israel, for the promise, for special revelation. And Nebuchadnezzar had done that. He was the head of gold. That was that's what set him apart. But now they're turning on that. And so the judgment falls. Meaning, meaning God hath numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. Paris, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. And apparently Belshazzar says, Oh, okay. <laughs> kind of obvious. All right. Well, let's go on with the party, you know. <laughs> he goes to bed that night and never wakes up. They award Daniel, and we're told in the last chapter, or the last verse, rather, a couple of verses. In that night, Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, was slain, and Darius the Median took the kingdom, being about three score and two years old. Uh, a couple it's of Darius things. Darius the Median, huh? Darius the Median. Darius the Median has given commentators a, a great deal of difficulty. Because as far as the secular histories, like Herodotus and archaeology, is concerned, there is no such person. Um, and f liberals have just said, well, see, Bible's wrong again. We'll ignore them. <laughs> but conservative commentators and, and, and people who want to do something with what the Bible says have tried a number of things, some of them very noble and, and seemingly promising until more archaeological light comes up and says, yeah, no, that doesn't work because evidence. Can we just clarify why we should ignore the liberal commentators? <laughs> uh, just that they are willfully discounting some of the chief <laughs> historical evidence available to us. Yeah. Out of hand. Like it's, it's, it's mm. their fault. They've discredited them themselves. Yeah, it's not that. just, we're painting with a, a broad brush and saying, well, if they're liberal, no. No, because they, they are. They, what makes them liberal is the fact that they're ignoring the chief historical <laughs> testimony. <laughs> <laughs> there's uh there's a book on uh secular creology written by as far as I know secularists I don't know that any of the men involved in the project were or bible believers but they're talking about the chronology as it unfolds about through this era and the 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 chief author turns and looks at us and says you know it's really funny that archaeologists and historians anthropologists have had all of this evidence in the bible if it were any other document, any other historical record, they'd be digging into it just to find, even if, even if they're not convinced it's all accurate, they would be looking into it to see what they could find there. And yet that's not what happens here. What happens here is that it gets written off without a look. Could it be that people would write off the Bible simply because it's the Bible? And he goes off and does talks about other things. But I thought it was a very perceptive move mm -hmm. by someone who, as far as I know, isn't even trying to defend Christianity, just saying, look, we have a source that's proved incredibly accurate again and again and again. Why not try to untie the knots and see if there's actually something we've missed 
rather than just saying, well, that's not how we call it. That's how not how we name it. That's not what the pieces we put together. So obviously it's wrong. <laughs> Drop it in a trash can someplace. Uh, to rise so, the median. Yes. So you were saying about the, the conservative commentators? The conservative commentators have tried to, to look for a historical figure. Um, John Wickham Jr. wrote probably the best. It was simply called Darius the Mede. Uh, and it's, it, it held up for a while until archaeology found that the man he was putting forth as a candidate for this position was dead. <laughs> he wasn't alive at this time. So he kind of, kind of, that kind of ruled him out. Um, <laughs> some have suggested that it was um, uh, Cyrus's father or, or, um, father in law, someone else, some median who it wouldn't be Cyrus's father, it'd have to be his um, grandfather, Grand grandfather, yeah, grand or grandfather, or something, yeah, on his, on his mom's side. Uh, maybe that's it. Maybe there was an independent median kingdom, and that's who this Darius was. And he took the kingdom and then shortly thereafter handed it over to Cyrus because there is a reference later to Cyrus having received the kingdom. Uh, the pro there's, there's several problems with that. One, historically, it's a ni it's nice speculation. There's no historical evidence for anything like that. Biblically, uh, the, the the prophecies come together in a weird way. Isaiah and Jeremiah do say that it will fall to the Medes, but again, there were no Persians. Uh, Daniel, as he's waiting, realizes that the first year of Cyrus's reign is the year when God's people will be set free. And he's waiting for it and is a little surprised when it hasn't happened. And this begins his prayer later on in the book that sets things in motion toward fulfillment. Cyrus, in his first year, decrees that God's people can go free. They can return home and build the temple and the city. And he sets in motion the restoration, the second exodus. There's no place in here for any other person, as soon as the prophecies run out, boom, there's Cyrus and Daniel saying, yeah, Cyrus, that's who it's all about. So what do we do with this? Well, first we recognize, as we've noticed before, that kings in the ancient world often had many different names. Mm -hmm. Now, this happens also with American presidents. Uh, there technically is no president named FDR, or Tricky Dick, <laughs> or <laughs> <It's> like, you know, <laughs> Bill Clinton. Bill is not a proper name. <laughs> Bill is not a proper name. Uh, names. I mean, even the the uh, kings and queens of England. Yeah. When they take the throne, they choose a oh, throne how, name. How many names did Victoria have? <laughs> they they go on and on. I don't even. Mm -hmm. I've never bothered to to learn all of them. Uh, the question is, what are people calling you, and who who are the people we're talking to? Well, Israel is looking for um, judgment by Medes. So let's look at the one candidate on the scene, Cyrus, and let's pick whatever people called him as a median, because he's descended from the Medes on one side, and we'll we'll use that. But then when we want to emphasize, yes, and this is the turn, this is the new kingdom, this is Persia, then we can use his Persian name. Now, there's more to it than that. And it's it's a detailed and at times a little bit tedious study. So I'm not going to try to pound all this out right now. But I do believe this is this is the answer because here's what really changes things. When Cyrus makes his decree, he says, the God of heaven has ordered me to build him a temple in Jerusalem. All of you people who were free-minded, go do that, and I'll fund it. And along the way, in a little parenthetical statement, he says, oh, and this God, he is the God. <laughs> How does Cyrus know about Yahweh? How does he know that Yahweh has commissioned him to build the temple and the city? Where did God do that anyway? God did that in Isaiah. Isaiah, long in advance, hundreds of years before, named the man who would restore Jerusalem, restore God's people to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple, and named him Cyrus and calls him his shepherd, his anointed, uh, his man who will do all his bidding, uh, the one who is going to set my people free. He is, a, he is one of the most typical, messianical, typical Gentiles in the whole Bible. <laughs> I mean, you, can go back, you have to go back to Melchizedek to find a Gentile who is so typical of Jesus. 
Um, and how did he get there? Well, I, I suggested that maybe Daniel met Cyrus when Daniel was acting as an ambassador to Elon, but that's not enough for this. That's not enough for true conversion. Is there something here in this first encounter between that's recorded in Scripture that would move Darius Cyrus to suddenly conclude that Yahweh is the king, and that would open him up to saying to Daniel, saying, um, "King, there's something you need to read." And that brings us to one of the most famous stories in all of Scripture. Every Christian child knows it. It's called Daniel and the Lion's Den. <laughs> this new king. Median Persian, wants to organize his kingdom. See, it is his kingdom. It's not someone else's kingdom. He's in charge, and he's re rearranging the administration. And rather than... Remember, Daniel was just made third ruler of the kingdom of Babylon. And when the Persians come in, they don't kill him. They say, in effect, hey, buddy, pal, how'd you like to help us run this kingdom? Do you do that? Well, if you know the guy already, you do. If you already know his character, you know he's trustworthy, you know his loyalties are not to Babylon, then maybe you do that. And everybody else gets jealous because this guy's really competent, this Daniel guy. He knows what he's doing. He knows what it's all about. The king is- But he's one of them. Yeah, he's one of them. He's a slave. He's a Jew. We got to get this guy. And thus, we are inter introduced into a Persian custom. Once the king makes a law, he cannot alter it. The laws of the Medes and Persians that alter not. Here it's Medes and Persians. In Esther, it's Persians and Medes, because by then the Persian influence was more dominant. And this king, who here is called Darius, misses it. It goes right over his head. He's busy with all kinds of things. He's just conquered an empire. He's doing administrative work. And it sounds good. Um, let everybody channel their prayers and petitions through me. I'll, I'll go directly to the gods because it, Babylon had collected all the gods, all the idols, and put them there. <laughs> Very convenient. Yeah. So Cyrus can just go and be, you know, Western Union and present the messages to the gods. And it will seem in everyone's idea that he's now the guy. He's the mediator. So he's not processing this. Daniel does. Daniel sees exactly what's going on. So he goes up into his upper room and prays. Although he's not supposed to now. And his enemies catch him. The king finds out. The king is horrified. Uh, this is not what he had in mind. He didn't see the trap, and he walked right into it. He spends all day trying to find a legal solution. And his guys say, no, 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 no. Law of the Medes and Persians can't change it. You do it. Because if you don't do it, you lose your throne. Our respect for you is gone. And so he throws Daniel into the lion's den. Um and the king goes and fasts and will not have any music or food or anything. He just waits. And early in the morning, he goes and calls out lamentably, O oh, Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God to whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions? And you can just see him collapsing on the great stone that's been rolled in front of the tomb, as it were. <laughs> You can tell what he thinks about all the Babylonian kings. It's like, yeah, yeah sure, there's, <laughs> or, uh, there's there's all these gods, but like, that's a lion. Yeah. <laughs> what are yeah, they going to yeah. do against that? Yeah, exactly. And Daniel's voice rises up from the pit and says, O oh, king, live forever. Mm -hmm. In the mouth of any other uh, court member, those are just words. Mm -hmm. From the mouth of Daniel, that's a prayer for his salvation. Mm-hmm. And the king is excited, grabs Daniel up. The other, all the enemies come and say, well, I bet they were stuffed lions or fed lions or some kind of... Yeah, they probably really? weren't hungry. They were hungry. You want to go find out? <laughs> 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 Look pretty hungry to me. Everybody else in. So da Cyrus Darius figures he now has divine approval to reverse all that nonsense. But this is how it ends. Then King Darius wrote unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. Notice again, this is not a sub-king, uh, a puppet king, an underly king. This is the guy at the top. Mm -hmm. And the guy at the top at this point is Cyrus. And this is what he says. That in e I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble in fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever. And his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed in his dominion, shall not, and his dominion shall be un, even unto the end. He delivereth 
and rescueth, he worketh signs and wonders in heaven and earth, who hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius. And here's a little word, vav in Hebrew. It can mean and, it can also mean even, or that is to say, or to wit. And if you render it that way, suddenly things make sense. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius, even in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. And so we've come to the first year, and now Cyrus is primed to listen to the prophecies of Isaiah and to say, oh, that God. He wants <laughs> me to do what? How long do I have? <laughs> should I get on this right away? Yes, you should get on this right away. The clock's ticking. Okay, well, let's get going. Let's, <laughs> let's get that decree signed then. And that brings us to the end of Ezra, or the beginning of Ezra, and the end of Second Chronicles, where we have the decree of Cyrus. Mm -hmm. uh, and speaking of clocks ticking, we have very few <laughs> moments left. Well, that's, so. that's great, because this is probably a good place to make the transition. So next time, we should talk about Cyrus uh, as, as the temple builder, as the, um, the second Moses, the one who sends God's people back out of captivity, leader of a, or commander at least, of a new exodus and of the beginning of the Restoration Era. And here we're going to run into uh, Zerubbabel, Jeshua, the rebuilding of the temple, and then eventually into Ezra, and Nehemiah, and Esther. So once again, God is tying the history of the covenant people to some very important historical things, as reckoned even by secularists. The secular world knows all about these things. It just doesn't take seriously why they're important. Mm -hmm. We will see Cyrus in heaven. He's God's anointed, God's shepherd, the man who does all his pleasure. Um, that's pretty cool. <laughs> that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. He was a friend of Daniel. That's even cooler. Um, well, maybe not cooler, but you know. Yeah, so, we can also see some of that transition from gold to silver in that yes. we both see Nebuchadnezzar and Cyrus as those we would expect uh, to see in heaven. And yet the grandeur of the revelation to Cyrus in some ways seems smaller to us than it was to Nebuchadnezzar. There's not mm -hmm. as many big visions and signs and no. miracles. And yet Cyrus, we would say it was actually more significant because we're moving into that restoration period right. where the big glory is more uh, veiled, yes. but the Lord is actually preparing us then for um, the coming of the new covenant. So we will pick up there. And also maybe if we can remember, look a little bit at uh, Persian culture, magi, and getting mm -hmm. drunk before you make a vote, and, you know, fun things. <laughs> Zoroastrianism. Fun things like Zoroastrianism. Ooh. Uh, Rachel, because that be still exists. To... Yeah. yeah. Well, Rachel, you're the church historian. You want to tackle Zoroastrianism next time? Sure. It, yeah. <laughs> Even its modern version. So it's still a yeah. um, allowed religion in Iran, funny mm. enough. <laughs> I, I looked it up to confirm, but yeah, it is, it's... The Islamic Republic allows Zoroastrianism. So, All right. We can I look forward to hearing time. more about that. <laughs> All right. Before we go, let's give some recommendations. My recommendation for today is uh, Fever Tree Premium Ginger Beer, which you can get at Costco. It's yummy. Okay. It's, it's a mixer. Um, so like it's meant to go in a, in a cocktail. So it's a very strong ginger flavor so that when you make the cocktail, you can still taste it. But I'm drinking it straight because it's good stuff. <laughs> Rachel, you got anything? Yes. Sorry, I was trying to remember <laughs> the exact name. Uh, so I was going to recommend a um, music group that is called Ordinary Time. They're mm. kind of a folksy sounding group, and they actually have a song that they did of this episode with Belshazzar oh. um, and Daniel. So it's some of their things are hymns that we know, and others are ones we've never heard of. Um, but I enjoy them as a kind of a folk group that does pretty much all Christian stuff. But yeah, random ones I have. I would never think to do something like Daniel and Belshazzar. That's so cool. Uh, so, yeah, there's mm -hmm. mine. I'm going to recommend Gilbert and Sullivan. <laughs> okay. Because why not? Yes. Why not indeed? Um, we, uh, in drama class, having finished Pride, doing producing Pride and Prejudice, we had to kill time. So we went back and watched two of our school's old productions, HMS Pinafore, second time we did it, and we just finished Pirates of Penzance. And they were so much fun. <laughs> and I, uh, 
They are so I much fun of, to do. They were. <laughs> uh, and, I, and I looked around on the internet afterward to, to just to see other professional versions done. And, you know, it was a little disappointing. It is hard. Opera companies are good at singing, one hopes. They're not necessarily good at doing group comedy. <laughs> uh, and sometimes in, in the late 20th century, it was more about being avant-garde and cool and different and trendy than it was about convincing people you were pirates on some island someplace. Um, I was disappointed. Uh, some, some of the pieces were good. Um, some were not. Ours, honestly, was just a lot of fun. And seeing <laughs> it, it was, okay, this is, um, what is the word when you're prejudiced against old age? Ageist? <laughs> Chronologically snobbish. <laughs> yeah, there you go. One of these productions where there's supposed to be all these young maidens mm -hmm. had women, most of whom were in their 50s and 60s. Oh, because they were accomplished opera singers. Because <laughs> they're accomplished opera singers. <laughs> <laughs> it just lacks something. But anyway, <laughs> f do what you can. There's always the pirate movie with Linda Ronstadt. Uh, but there are probably better versions. But you might want to look around a little bit, especially if you've never encountered Gilbert and Sullivan and don't even know what I'm talking about. Um, the Simpsons uh, do a tribute to it. Who's the the bad guy in The Simpsons? That's just assuming you uh, watch The Simpsons. I've never know. seen The Simpsons. You've I've never seen, seen The Simpsons. I've seen select episodes. Okay. There, there's a bad it. guy who's got Bart on a boat. The guy who and, says, excellent Smithers. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I don't know his name. I just know he's his excellent uh, smithers. <laughs> and Bart, to buy time, is this, uh, you have one rest of quest? Well, yeah, well, no, but you wouldn't. What, 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 what? Would you please sing the entire uh, uh, opera of um, uh, HMS Pinafore? <laughs> well, okay. And so <laughs> the whole thing crammed into about five minutes. On for for other people maybe who watch Star Trek, there is a scene where Picard is trying to distract Data, who's mind wiped or controlled or something, and he starts singing a British tar, <laughs> and Worf reluctantly goes along, and Data starts singing, and it saves the day. Anyway, as you listen, oh, and of course Indiana Jones. Um, our friend in Egypt who starts singing again, a British tar. Anyway, <laughs> if you don't know what it is, watch it. You'll suddenly realize, wait, I've seen this before. There you go. <laughs> and I would make a plug that there actually is a Cornerstone Drama YouTube channel where you can go <laughs> watch the full length productions. Well, Which is I, very funny. I remember Greg telling us at the, um, some, some event or other. Uh, that the first time you did Pinafore at your school, no one had really heard of it. No. And no one, even looking up the professional performances, they're like, why would we do this? This is not funny or fun right. or anything. No, the professional And then they do the it and it's like, oh, old. this is hilarious. This is hilarious. Yeah. yeah. Now we know. Because it has to be done in the proper spirit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. It like is true. Monty Python or um, Saturday Night Live. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. <laughs> On that note, thank you both so much for this conversation. It's been a delight. Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thank you for, for our transcripts, our dear transcriptionist. Uh, if you'd like to receive those in your email inbox, you can subscribe to our Substack. Um, just search Halting Towards Zion. We'll come up. Um, you can send us an email at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. And a big thank you also to our financial supporters who keep the show rolling. If you'd like to join their number, dear listener, you can visit our Patreon. That's patreon.com slash haltingtowardszion. Thanks so much for listening. Hope to see you next week.